here is the fourth and final part of the lecture four. In this part, we shall discuss about geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is thermal energy generated and stored in the earth. Thermal energy is the energy that determines the temperature of the matter. The geothermal energy of the Earth's crust originates from the original formation of the planet and from radioactive decay of the materials in currently uncertain but possibly roughly equal proportions. The Earth's internal heat is thermal energy generated from radioactive decay and continual heat loss from Earth's formation. Temperatures at the core mental boundary may reach over 4000 degrees Celsius, that is 7200 degrees Fahrenheit. The high temperature and pressure in the Earth's interior cause some rocks to melt and solid mantle to behave plastically, resulting in portions of the mantle convecting upward since it is lighter than the surrounding rock. Rock and water is heated in the crust sometimes up to 370 degrees Celsius or 700 degrees Fahrenheit. With water from hot springs, geothermal energy has been used for bathing since Paleolithic times and for space heating since ancient Roman times. But it is now better known for electricity generation. Worldwide, 11,700 megawatts of geothermal power was available in the year 2013 as in the records. An additional 28 gigawatts of direct geothermal heating capacity is installed for district heating, space heating spas, industrial processes, desalination and agricultural applications as of the year 2010. Geothermal power is cost effective reliable, sustainable, and environmentally friendly, but has historically been limited to areas near tectonic plate boundaries. Recent technologically advanced have dramatically expanded the range and size of viable resources, especially for applications such as home heating, opening a potential for widespread exploitation. Geothermal wells release greenhouse gases trapped deep within the earth, but these emissions are much lower per energy unit than those of fossil fuels. Here is a picture of the oldest known pool fed by a hot spring. This was built in the Kin dynasty in the 3rd century BCE. It was found in an archaeological dig under the Huaqing Chi Resort on Lysan Mountain in China. Here is presented some pictures explaining the uses of geothermal energy in different lights. The first one is the fishing cone geyser in Yellowstone Lake. It is in USA. The first geothermal heating system, thermal spa Baden, Baden in Roman soldier spa, underfloor heating system since year 2000 years ago. The third one is the ruins of Roman bathing facility at the thermal springs of Baden Villa in the Rhine Rift Valley. This is now in southern Germany. Here are some more pictures of the hot water springs. The first one is a geyser and the yellow surroundings is due to the minerals, especially sulfur. In the second and the other two pictures is the Maori village where Maori women of New Zealand are cooking their food by dipping the bag containing food in the hot water. Maori villages in the New Zealand, they have some tribes which still follow the old methods of cooking food in the hot water spring. This is environmental friendly and non-polluting.
Here in the picture is shown how geothermal energy could be harvested for home applications. The loops of pipes in the vertical direction circulating water could access the energy from the inner crust and transmit to the houses. The loops could be of different designs such as horizontal loop, slinky loop and pond loop. A geothermal heat pump can extract enough heat from shallow ground anywhere in the world to provide home heating. But industrial applications need the higher temperatures of deep resources. The thermal efficiency and probability of profits of electricity generation is particularly sensitive to temperature. The most demanding applications receive the greatest benefit from a high natural heat flux, ideally from using a hot spring. The next best option is to drill a well into a hot aquifer. If no adequate aquifer is available, an artificial one may be built by injecting water to hydraulically fracture the bedrock. This last approach is called hot dry rock geothermal energy in Europe or enhanced geothermal system in North America. Much greater potential may be available from this approach than from conventional trapping of natural aquifers. The different elements of the enhanced geothermal system is shown in the picture. These are the production wells, pump house, injection well, reservoir, heat exchanger, turbine hall, hot water to district heating, through supply chains, then porous rock sediments observation well and crystalline bedrock through which the production well has to be dig out and constructed. This picture represents the different elements of harvesting geothermal energy. The injected fluid enhances the transmissivity of the rock and maintains a reservoir fluid. The fluid flows through the rock along permeable pathways picking up in situ heat. The fluid is pumped to the surface through the production wells and sent to the power plant where the stream drives the turbine generator and produces electricity. The water vapor from the cooling facility is again used for heating the houses. Power plant generates electricity which could be transmitted to the power grids. There are three main categories of geothermal plants to harvest the geothermal energy, namely liquid dominated geothermal plants, vapor dominated geothermal plants and binary cycle plants. Here we shall discuss the liquid dominated geothermal plants. In liquid dominated plants, geothermal plants are built upon liquid reservoirs within the earth's surface. The liquid is sent through one or more separators in order to lower the pressure of the water, creating a steam. This steam then propels a turbine generator, causing it to produce electricity. This steam is then condensed back into a liquid and placed back into the liquid reservoir it originated from. This type of geothermal plant is very common and provides a sustainable, reusable form of energy. Liquid dominated power plants are also referred to as flash steam power plants as they conduct flash steam by pressurizing hot water from the surface of the earth. Each power plants operate 
using water reservoirs with temperatures greater than 360 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid dominated reservoirs are more common than others causing them to produce more electricity and power more stations. These reservoirs are found in specific locations including rough zones, mantle, hot spots and near new volcanoes in the Pacific Ocean. The largest liquid dominated system in the world is found at Cerro Frito. Here in the picture is showing steam rising from Ms. Javlier geothermal power station in Iceland. In the category vapor dominated geothermal plants, the steam reservoirs are very rare but are an incredibly efficient sustainable energy resource. The geysers in California is the most prominent dry steam reservoir. A dry steam plant works in a similar fashion to a liquid dominated geothermal plant. Steam is obtained by drilling between 7 to 10,000 feet deep into the earth's crust. The steam is then obtained, is piped directly to the turbine generator producing electricity. The steam is then condensed and placed back into the steam reservoir providing a reusable energy resource. Vapor dominated plants also referred to as dry steam power plants are so rare that only two locations exist in United States. These include the geysers in the California, previously mentioned never and the famous dry steam reservoir held at Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is legally protected from geothermal development, so only one plant exists in United States. The most prominent international dry steam power plant exists in Lardarello, Italy. In Lardarello, hot granite on the earth's surface creates boiling water and hot steam under the earth's surface. The geothermal plant in Lardilero is able to convert this dry steam into 594 megawatts of electricity, enough to power 594,000 homes. Comparatively, the geothermal plant produces over 40 times this amount of energy, producing 27,500 megawatts of energy. The third category in the list is binary cycle plants. A binary cycle power plant is used when the water in a reservoir is not hot enough to transform into steam. This lower temperature water is instead used to heat a liquid that expands when heated. This fluid increases the pressure around the generator causing the turbine to turn and produce electricity. The fluid is recycled and used again to form a reusable energy resource. This is the most readily available geothermal resource throughout the country as it does not require a specific liquid or steam reservoirs. Binary plants work upon liquid dominated reservoirs found under the earth's surface. However, unlike the flash steam plants, binary plants work with water at lower temperatures between 225 and 360 degrees Fahrenheit. Due to the lower temperatures of this water, the water must be pumped up to the earth's surface and boiled into a working liquid. Due to the abundance of cold water reservoirs in the earth's surface, Binary cycle power plants make up the majority of geothermal plants in the United States. Binary cycle power plants also create minimal air emissions due to the constant separation between the water from the earth's surface and the working fluids using during the operation. Here is the picture in which all the three methods 
are kept together for comparison. In the first picture, the diagram showing how electricity is generated from a liquid dominated gen geothermal plant, also known as hot water hydrothermal system. The part of the hydrothermal water that flashes to steam is separated and used to drive turbine generator. Waste water from separator and condenser is injected back into the subsurface to help expand and extend the useful length of the hydrothermal system. In the second picture, the diagram showing how electricity is generated from a vapor dominated hydro hydrothermal system or the geothermal system. Steam is used directly from the wells to drive a turbine generator and the wastewater from the condenser is injected back into the subsurface to help extend the useful life of the hydrothermal system. In the third picture representing binary cycle plants shows how electricity is generated from a moderate temperature hydrothermal system using a binary system. The geothermal water is used to boil a second fluid isobutane in this example whose vapor then drives the turbine generator. The wastewater is injected back into the subsurface to help extend the useful life of the hydrothermal system or the geothermal system. Here is a picture of geothermal power station in the Philippines. Here is another picture of Krafla geothermal station in the northeast Iceland. As of the year, by 2012, there were 24 countries worldwide producing 11,400 megawatts of geothermal power. An additional 28 gigawatts of direct geothermal heating capacity is installed for district heating, space heating, spas, industrial processes, desalination and agricultural applications in 2010. Below is the list of countries with installed geothermal electrical capacity. USA tops the chart followed by Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, Italy, New Zealand, Iceland and Japan. Here is listed the relative merits of geothermal energy. The fluids drawn from the deep earth carry a mixture of gases, notably carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, methane, and ammonia. Hot water from geothermal resources may hold in solution trace amounts of toxic elements such as mercury, arsenic, boron, and antimony. The direct geothermal heating system contains pumps and compressors which may consume energy from a polluting source. Plants construction can adversely affect land stability. Enhanced geothermal systems can trigger earthquakes as part of hydraulic fracturing. They use 20 liters equivalent of 5.3 gallons of fresh water per megawatt hour versus over 1000 liters that is 260 gallons per megawatt hour for nuclear coal or oil. The geothermal has minimal land and freshwater requirements. Geothermal plants use 3.5 square kilometers equivalent of 1.4 square miles per gigawatt of electrical production versus 32 kilometers and 12 square kilometers for coal facilities and wind farm respectively. Now we shall see in brief some mishappenings related to the geothermal power production. One such accident is subsidence 
which occurred at Wairaki Field in New Zealand and predicted uplift at Venice. The total subsidence at the Wairaki Geothermal Field over the years 1953 and 2005 period counterline interval. And the second picture is predicted uplift at Venice after 10 years of injection into the saline aquifers 650 to 1000 meters deep below the lagoon. The injection wells are marked in red. The total subsidence at the Viraki geothermal field over the years between 1953 and 2005 period is related to extracting steam at Viraki that has caused the ground to subside. This map shows the total subsidence measured over almost 50 years from 1953 to 2001. The contour interval is 1 meter. The greatest subsidence up to 14 meters is in the immediate area of the bore field. A larger area has subsided by over a meter indicating that extraction of geothermal fluid may affect the large area in the long term. Another incident in the list of accidents related to the geothermal power production is the cracks in the historical city hall at Stoffen, Germany, possibly due to damage from geothermal drilling. In Stoffen, tectonic uplift occurred in a state due to a previously isolated anhydrite layer coming in contact with water and turning into gypsum, doubling its volume. Since 2008, the center of the city has reported to have risen some 12 centimeters after initially sinking a few millimeters. This has caused considerable damage to the buildings in the city center, including the historical town hall as shown in the picture. The cause of this geological change has been identified as a drilling operation conducted in the summer and autumn of the year 2007 to provide geothermal heating to the city hall. The drilling perforated an anhydrite layer and caused high pressure groundwater to come into contact with the anhydrite, which then began to expand. By the year 2010, some sections of the town has risen by 30 centimeters. In July 2013, no end to the rising process was in sight. Here in the picture, the formation of fault is presented diagrammatically. The direct fluid pressure effects of injection when fluid pressure diffusion takes place into the well and faults are generated. This initiated by increase in pore pressure along fault required high permeability pathway. Change in the loading condition on fault creates widening and increase in the size of the same. Enhanced geothermal systems can trigger earthquakes as part of hydraulic fracturing. One such incidence is the man-made earthquake in Switzerland. Geothermal drilling triggers a magnitude of 3.6 earthquake in Citratable near St. Gallen. In July 20th in the year 2013, the quake has been felt from Lake Contents up to the Appenzell region. The work at the 4,450-meter-deep geothermal borehole are temporarily halted. 
in the year 2009 a geothermal project in basel had failed because of a triggered earthquake in basel several tremors up to the magnitude of 3.4 had been registered one of the possible cause may be related to a sudden and unexpected gas penetration into the well which happened during the drilling to counter this gas intrusion 650 cubic meters of water and heavy drilling mud were pumped into the hole this process could have triggered the earthquake the project in the basel switzerland was suspended because more than 10000 seismic events measuring up to 3.4 on the richter scale occurred over the first 6 days of water injection the main benefits of geothermal power has been listed in this slide geothermal power provides clean and safe energy using little land it is renewable and sustainable generates continuous reliable base load power conserves fossil fuels and contributes to diversity in energy sources avoids importing and benefits local economies offer modular incremental development and village power to remote sites this brings us to conclude the part 4 of the lecture and here is the assignment question which part of the wind and geothermal energy production do you think should be considered to be a topic for extensive research in the current and future times please write one to two paragraphs and send it to my email